I'm Richard Taylor from the Philosophy Department at Marquette University. This is the course Thomas Aquinas, and the focus is the nature and attainment of happiness. This is a course taught both at Marquette University and also at the Catholic University of Leuven with my colleague Andrea Robilio. Professor Robilio and his class will be joining us on the 25th of September when classes begin in Leuven. At that time, our major focus will be on Thomas Aquinas and the nature and attainment of happiness in his thought. Prior to that, in our class, we'll be looking at major issues in the thought of Aquinas, including his epistemology, his understanding of the relationship of philosophy and religion, uh, his uh, metaphysical thought to some extent, and some other basic issues that are very important in the thought of Aquinas. <clears throat> when we begin this course then on the 28th of August here in Milwaukee. But as I said, we will join uh, using technology, uh, internet technology. We'll be joining with Professor Robilio and his class on the 25th. So without further ado, let me proceed with a, what is a, meant to be just a brief introduction to our course. So I welcome you. <clears throat> the aims of the course are, first of all, to develop skills and re of reasoning and thoughtful study in students as philosophers. So let me be very clear. Although Aquinas was first and foremost a, theo a theologian, he is, he is uh, considered by us, both in his theological context and, uh, and in his philosophical skills uh, as well. So what we want to do is have a critical understanding of the thought and insights of Aquinas, on the nature of happiness, properly in the context of his engagement with sources from the Arabic tradition, as well as from his own Christian tradition. That Christian tradition, of course, is the tradition of Scripture, but also the tradition of Scripture as interpreted by St. Augustine. And there is a particular work by St. Augustine that we will be looking at later on. In fact, that work is called uh, On Seeing God. And uh, in the Christian context, the ultimate end of human existence is to see God hence the relevance of that. But also to see the nature of separate substances is found to be uh, the end and goal and fulfillment uh, in happiness in the Arabic tradition as well. So we'll get into some details on that, certainly. And number two, the structure of the course. <clears throat> uh, systematic and critical study of Aquinas' key historical sources, followed by examination of the development of his teaching through his major works from, from 1252 to his death in 1274, and will do so through a selection of important texts and arguments. And of course, we can't cover all the works of Aquinas, which are massive uh, in, uh, in quantity and extraordinarily sophisticated in quality, but we're going to focus right in on this idea of what is the nature of happiness and how is it to be attained. Course materials will be using selected texts from Aquinas and also other thinkers such as Aristotle and the Arabic tradition and, as I said, a key work by St. Augustine. We'll also be making use of video lectures. As I'll explain in the next video, but I'll mention it here briefly, <clears throat> that in this course then we'll be using video lectures, two 30-minute video lectures per week is the plan. Anyway, I have to keep track of the time, I suppose. Uh, two 30-minute video lectures per week, <coughs> pardon me, are, which are to be viewed in advance of class. And then, of course, there are assigned readings to be considered in detail. And then when we have class, we'll be getting together to discuss key issues on doctrines, doctrines as found uh, in, these, uh, in these works and in the material and in the lectures, that sort of thing. And we want to bring critical analysis to these. We want to understand what's going on in its proper historical and philosophical context, and we want to analyze it for its cogency. Now, uh, uh, the uh, fourth point here, efficient causes. In this work that we'll be doing, the efficient causes are the instructor, instructors, mainly, namely myself, Richard Taylor from Marquette, and Professor Andrea Robilio from the Catholic University of Leuven. But also, of course, you are self-movers, and so you too are efficient causes in this action. And finally, we're going to have quite the treat uh, with uh, special guest professor uh, Carlos Steele from the Catholic University of Leuven, a, a, an expert in Neoplatonism and Greek philosophy, but also an expert in Aquinas, and also the implications of Aquinas' thought. And Professor Steele has uh, kindly offered to be present at our, our uh, meetings together, and even to present a, a class, uh, the final class for Marquette, the December 4 class, uh, for both 
of both groups working together. So that would be quite the treat, I think. Let me go on a bit more now, though. So, required assignments for the course. Well, these are spelled out for you in the syllabus, but first of all, there'll be these video lectures, two per week in 30-minute segments. And they'll also be assigned texts and readings. And these texts and readings, then, are focused in on our topic. There'll be subsidiary considerations and contextual considerations, namely the notion of how it is that we see God face to face, how we have intellectual understanding of God, what, what is the metaphysics and psychology that makes this possible, according to Aquinas. We'll be going through those in detail. There'll also be active participation in international online discussions of texts, interpretations, and issues. We'll be doing it this way. We'll be meeting at 9 o'clock and then have half an hour to prepare, get ourselves prepared, and then we'll have a full hour of connection with the Catholic University of Leuven class, and then we'll have 30 minutes for discussion uh, at the end. So that's two hours of class on Thursdays every week for us, uh, one hour of it to be with, uh, connected with KU Leuven. That connection with KU Leuven will start on the 25th of September. In the meantime, as you'll see when we go over the syllabus in detail in the next video, <clears throat> in the meantime we have uh, other uh, issues in Aquinas to, uh, to uh, consider and look at in some detail, uh, philosophically, before we join up with K.U. Leuven. In the, uh, once we do connect with Leuven, uh, after the first couple of classes, we're going to have graduate students work in teams, and those teams will be responsible for one week of, of work in the class, and that will involve guiding and stimulating guiding and stimulating online discussions. Yes, there will be required online discussions uh, as outside of class. Uh, preparing a three-page, actually it's going to be three to five page, we'll expand that a bit, three to five page report on key aspects of philosophical issues from the video, from the text resources assigned, and secondary, primary and secondary literature, and the online discussions. Now this three-page or three to five-page report is to be submitted by noon the day before class, the class live meeting. That is by noon on Wednesdays. So we'll form a group of students, probably about three students, and they'll have the they'll have the obligation to guide online discussions and also to prepare this uh, three to five-page report, single space report. And then that group will be asked then to narrow this down to no more than a seven-minute presentation of what issues they think are most important to initiate the discussion. And from there, when we're working live with Leuven, then we'll just proceed with the discussion and see what direction it takes. So, so the lectures for this class are not in the physical class. The lectures for the class are going to be in the videos and occasionally expansion on the issues by Professor Abelia or myself will take place and may turn into a bit of a lecture now and then because these are complex matters and they need to be explained in detail. And then finally among the assignments then there is the preparation of a course paper in accord with the standards and requirements of each student's program. I phrase it that way because the program in Leuven has, has different requirements than the program here at Marquette University. And that's fine. We've done this now. This is our third year doing this and this, uh, these can be accommodated quite well. In fact, there are different requirements. Now just a little bit on Thomas Aquinas himself. Thomas Aquinas died in 1274. Now, the issue of happiness, particularly ultimate happiness, is key to his entire thought. Why? Well, it is the end of human existence. The answer, ultimate, question to that, uh, ultimate answer to that question, why? Why do we do what we do? Why do we pursue the ends we do? And we do so because there is an ultimate fulfillment for human beings, according to the account of Aquinas, but it's also according to the account of Aristotle and the Aristotelian tradition and the, uh, the Arabic tradition and philosophy and the other, other tradition leading, uh, in the Latin tradition leading up to Aquinas as well. So ultimate happiness is key to everything that we do and everything that we, and it is everything we hope to achieve, ultimately, according to Aquinas and the Aristotelian and medieval tradition. Uh, Aquinas is also renowned for his, his metaphysical thought on God and creatures in terms of essence existence distinction. We'll talk about that a bit, that's important here. His doctrine on epistemology, 
his conception of human soul and human intellect, his views on the relationship of philosophy and religion, and his proof of God, and much more. Now these are issues that we'll touch on in the first, uh, first five weeks in, when the course is solely at Marquette. Leuven students are welcome to come back and look at, look at the material and that sort of thing if they wish, but their primary focus is going to be on the issue of happiness, as will be ours starting on, the, starting on classes after the 25th of September. Aquinas, that we should take note, Aquinas is first and foremost a theologian and a doctor of the church. But he's also a philosopher of extraordinary intellectual insight and breadth of understanding. It's really quite extraordinary in studying his works. You can find that he will often penetrate beyond the words of Aristotle and even the commentators on Aristotle and the Arabic tradition to see, see the deeper issues that are not evident at the top of the text, as it were, in the face of the text. He has an extraordinary mind, and uh, really, uh, it's quite remarkable, uh, the insights that he has. Even if we disagree with him, the analyses that he provides certainly puts him among the foremost philosophers in the history of philosophy, even if he were, even if he was a theologian. He's also had a persisting influence through the centuries for both his theology and his philosophical teachings. So he is a doctor of the church, and uh, perhaps the foremost doctor of the church, uh, the Catholic Church, but he's also had an enormous impact on the way we even understand philosophy of religion today. He sees a representative of a major tradition in the philosophical discussions, and uh, his arguments for the existence of God, and much, much more, are often considered in courses on contemporary philosophy of religion. So I think it's quite relevant. But let's carry on. Now, some of the major influences regarding his understanding of happiness are, first of all, Aristotle, and there's a photo, as you can see, of Aristotle. Uh, Aristotle on uh, happiness and its char dual character. Aristotle discusses the nature of happiness in his Nicomachean Ethics, Book 1, Chapter 7, and also in, in he discusses it a bit uh, in Book 9, which is on friendship, We'll be looking at that as well as Book 1, Chapter 7. And we'll also look carefully at his discussion in Nicomachean Ethics, Book 10, Chapters 6 through 8. These are the texts which are foundational for the understanding of the nature of happiness by Aquinas, but also for Aquinas' other sources in the Arabic tradition. As I said earlier, we'll also be looking at St. Augustine on, on uh, move these down here. Why not? Sorry about that. We'll also be looking at uh, St. Augustine's conception of happiness as the vision of God. And Augustine is no fool. Of course, it's not the vision of the physical eyes that's being talked about, but rather it's a kind of intellectual vision. Uh, what, what, uh, uh, pardon me, Augustine's uh, short treatise is extremely valuable, and we have a translation of it thanks to my Marquette University colleague, Roland Teske, who translated uh, this uh, letter 147 and the short book on the vision of God that Augustine wrote in connection with letter 147. But more details on that later. In the Arabic tradition, al farabi and Avicenna explored the intellectual and political character of human happiness. This involves both metaphysics and also politics and society because happiness is about human fulfillment and human fulfillment takes place in the context of society, not uh, in a person isolating him or herself from society, but rather being engaged in society. Nevertheless, it's still intellectual. Precisely how they approach the issue is part of what we're looking at in this, uh, in this context. We'll also look at the we'll also look look at the work of Averroes on philosophical happiness in the knowledge of metaphysics. In the knowledge of metaphysics, and it's rather interesting. Uh, he says that the most perfect worship of God is to be found in the study of God and the creatures of God through the science of metaphysics. And he means the Aristotelian science of metaphysics. It's all the more interesting, too, that while Al-Farabi and Avicenna, Augustine, uh, and certainly Aquinas, think that there is an afterlife for human beings, Averroes 
seems not to have provision in his philosophy for the possibility of a human afterlife. What about Aristotle in that regard? Well, obviously some of the tradition thought Aristotle held for some kind of afterlife, but it seems, it seems at least with regard to contemporary interpretations, it seems that, that in fact, uh, Aristotle did not uh, hold for an afterlife. But we'll get into these things in great detail. Uh, what's particularly interesting, and I'll just mention this on the side, is uh, a art recent article by Adriano Oliva on the, on the uh, philosopher's conception of human fulfillment or contemplation in contemplation, and the discussion there uh, that Oliva highlights about the attainment of happiness, fulfillment, and afterlife on the part of pagan philosophers according to the thought of Aquinas. It should be a rather interesting topic. It is, in fact, in his account. So we'll look at that in some detail. Now, uh, let's talk a little bit about the movement into this discussion of happiness in Aquinas. Now, Aquinas developed teachings on soul and intellect, and those teachings held that, first of all, all natural knowledge begins in sense perception of the world. This is something that Avicenna and Averroes also held. Aquinas also held that uh, sensation and brain or heart activities called internal senses are required for intellectual knowledge. That intellectual knowledge is not of particulars as such, but of universals. So it begins in sense perception, and then it's further, act it's further actualized to some degree by sensation and brain activities. And then finally, we attain intellectual knowledge in some way, but that intellectual knowledge is not of particulars as such, but of universals. Consequently, a power beyond the physical is required, an immaterial intellectual power for Aquinas. And that is something which Avicenna and Averroes also concur. This power abstracts or transfers or separates the sensible apprehension from the mode of particularity and potential intelligibility to form the universal, according to Aquinas. This content comes from the world. Now, that particular teaching, then, Aquinas finds firmly set forward, set forth for him in the work of Averroes. The powers active in the human soul, according to Aquinas, are the agent or active intellect that does the process of abstraction and the receptive or possible, or in some cases also called material intellect, that receives the immaterial intelligible. And the term possible intellect that Aquinas adopts comes from Avicenna. But the dis distinction of these two kinds of intellect comes from, from Aristotle's De Anima, Book 3, Chapter 5. So this is the basic movement toward the formation of intellectual understanding. We start with the world for Aquinas, and we further refine it with our powers of sensation and brain, and then finally we are able to, because of a special ability that we have, called the agent or active intellect, we are then able to in some way transfer or abstract that intelligible that's in the world in particulars to the level of intelligible and act in, in, as an intelligible in the human mind. Uh, for Avicenna and Al-Farabi, there was assistance on the part of a separate entity, and, and that entity was called each interactive intellect. For Averroes, there was also some assistance, although he has a distinctive doctrine. For Aquinas himself, this is part of the individual human soul. So this intellectual ability to form an immaterial understanding of intelligibles, according to Aquinas and the tradition, offers proof that the soul has an activity essential to its nature which is not dependent on body. Because universals, or intelligibles in act, are not material things. And an immaterial thing, then, uh, does not exist as such in a body. Now, Aristotle at the Anima Book 2, Chapter 2, writes that intellect may be a different kind of soul than the soul that exists only in body. So Aristotle was well aware of this notion of mind or intellect as being some kind of uh, immaterial power. And so the tradition was very well aware of this particular comment by Aristotle 
and developed in accord with what this comment seems to indicate, although there are multiple interpretations of exactly what he says. Happiness as the ultimate end for human beings is intellectual in nature, for Aquinas, as Aristotle holds, but the immaterial nature of the soul and its intellectual activity indicates that it is incorruptible. So this is contrary, it seems contrary to Aristotle, but nevertheless, Aquinas thinks it is the proper understanding of Aristotelian doctrine. So for Aquinas then, if there's an immaterial activity, then that immaterial activity must take place in an immaterial substance. And so the soul must by nature be an immaterial substance and intellectual activity is indicative of that. Hence, Aristotle's writing, it seems to be a different kind of soul. However, the attainment of, all, of perfect or ultimate happiness is beyond the reach of mere human powers and requires of its very nature something to make happiness, make the happiness humans desire to be realized in them in some way. It may be that people because of, of disease, illness, imperfection, uh, insufficient resources, etc., are not able to attain highest intellectual happiness. And so there should be some other, some other way that this happens. Well, the interpretation of this is rather complex. And we have to be careful about this because uh, that fact that we want, is it enough that we actually want something uh, that uh, the power be realized in us? Well, this is connected with Aristotle's notion that nature does nothing in vain and putting the, the desire in us to have perfect happiness uh, as, uh, as something natural to us indicates that uh, this is not something in vain but somehow can be realized. Precisely how it can be realized, precisely the nature of happiness, and whether it can be what Aquinas heads for here is another question. It involves his interpretation of the tradition. Now, as we'll, we will see, the attainment of happiness for Aquinas is an intellectual perfection for human beings, as we already indicated from the philosophical tradition. And for Aquinas, this is what scripture describes as seeing God face to face or seeing uh, in uh, seeing into God's very essence. Religion promises this to human beings as their ultimate fulfillment and happiness. And again, Aquinas is primarily a theologian, and so this is a doctrine that he holds because religion promises it. But Aquinas brings an intellectualist interpretation to this from the philosophical tradition. An intellectualist ter interpretation which not all of his colleagues uh, in, uh, in the Christian tradition would accept for Aquinas, this true religious doctrine, namely that ultimately human beings will be fulfilled in seeing God face to face through an activity which is intellectual in nature, an activity open to human beings who in this life are highly intellectual or not, this comes about only thanks to God's, uh, God's activity in human beings to bring them to the level of fulfillment or ultimate happiness for Aquinas. So, as I said, for Aquinas, this true religious doctrine requires explication not only in theology, which is an explication based on revelation and reason, but also in philosophical rationality in accord with the thought of the pagan Aristotle and reasoned, reasoned in critical dialogue with the most sophisticated philosophical works of his day. And the most sophisticated philosophical works of his day were the works of Aristotle, taken together with the commentaries of Averroes, and also the, the, uh, the detailed works of Avicenna in his Shifat, or the healing, which is, uh, which is translated into, in its many parts, was translated into Latin, as were the commentaries, most of the commentaries, uh, most of the large commentaries by Averroes. As we'll see now, in his first extended treatment of this issue, Aquinas draws deeply on the Greek tradition of Theophrastus and Themistius, and also on the Arabic tradition of Al-Farabi, Avicenna, Ibn Bajan, and Averroes, all of whom provide accounts reasoned philosophically about the nature of happiness. So Aquinas is looking at the very best philosophical accounts of this notion, and he's also insisting that there is one truth here that is, is one and the same in what is, what is told to human beings through theology and religion, 
and what is told to them through, through philosophical uh, studies. Hence I say for Aquinas there are two routes to true to one truth, both and both are invaluable for human beings and their fulfillment. Now one of the assigned articles that uh, we have on our syllabus is by Adriana Oliva, and you should take special note of the remarks that Oliva makes in that article when he mentions something about uh, there being a truth higher than the truth of philosophy and a truth higher than the truth of theology. What Oliva is doing is explaining that for Aquinas, the truth that God has transcends both theology and philosophy. And Aquinas is asserting that both theology and philosophy have routes to understanding the nature of God and routes to human fulfillment. But neither of these human efforts alone is sufficient to attain the fulfillment of human beings in ultimate happiness. That fulfillment in ultimate happiness only happens when God is involved in some fashion in raising human beings up to the level where they can see God face to face. Or, to put it in a philosophical way, where they can see ultimate truth, reality, and goodness. So let me conclude this, this uh, short video here uh, with just a few final remarks. The course uh, is designed for a learning experience that is historically accurate, philosophically engaging, and also internationalist realization. So we're not going to just confine ourselves to, uh, to our classroom at Marquette or our classroom at Leuven. Rather, we want to reach out, gather more people into the discussion, and have a much richer and more full understanding by the end of the course. In this course, intellectual and dialectical engagement with the instructors and other students internationally is something we will be encouraging in every part of the course. If you don't know how to use Skype, see me about this. I'll explain it to you and help you along with it. But we want you engaged, we want the students engaged, both through the online discussions, which will be on the D2L system at Marquette, uh, both on the online discussions and also outside of class with other students. If you have questions and you want to have dialogue with people, you'll have their email addresses. You'll have access to, to make arrangements to talk with them and discuss things. We want as much intellectual uh, and dialectical engagement as possible, but not only with us, but also among students. And do it internationally. I think that it, it, it's really quite fascinating to see the different perspectives and different interests uh, of students at, at K. Leuven with its extremely international uh, group of students uh, in, a, in that large international program that they have there and with our own Marquette University students who tend for the most part to be Americans. Uh, for Marquette students then we begin with consideration of key teachings of Aquinas before we link with KU Leuven and uh, Dr. Rubilio and the graduate students there. So let me conclude now uh, and uh, say that I'll turn to the details of the syllabus and the technology used in this course in next video, that's, which is video 1B. So this is the conclusion of video 1A.